This is Right to Life Radio with John Girardi on Power Talk 96.7 and AM 1400, a production of Right to Life of Central California. And now, here's your host, John Girardi. This week, we could do two shows. We could do two hours for Right to Life Radio. Welcome, everyone. This is John Girardi from Right to Life of Central California. And joining me, as always, Jonathan Keller from California Family Council. How's it going, Jonathan? Hey, it, it's the jet-lagged, uh, wind-burnt. Uh, very b- glad to be back where the the low was the high uh, in D.C. <laughs> Our low here in California was the high in D.C. So I'm, ha- oh, I'm okay. happy to oh, be okay, back okay. from a cold, cold okay. March for Life. It was very cold at the March for Life yes. in D.C. Okay, yes. so Jonathan was at the March for Life in Washington, D.C. I was. I went to the Walk for Life West Coast in San Francisco. That is how much we care about you, dear listener. We, we will go yeah. coast to coast yeah. to bring you the news. Exactly. So uh, today on the show, first a correction. Uh, last week we were talking about how the Fresno City Council might be considering a resolution to honor the anniversary of Roe v. Wade. Well, it turns out they are not going to take up that resolution. So hooray. Thank, thank God they're not going to. Um, now, this week we have a ton of stuff to talk about. Uh Obviously, we just had the anniversary of Roe v. Wade on this past Saturday. We had the big pro-life marches, um, and there is a lot of activity in the California state legislature going on right now, including a really bad bill that is moving just one click closer to final passage that our friends at Pro-Life San Francisco have been really on top of, especially our friend Robert Byrd, who who is one of their, uh, one of their lead dudes. So... And I'm talking about SB 245. Now, Jonathan, we had some attention on this last year. It didn't wind up passing the state legislature last year. It became a two-year measure, meaning that the legislature had two years to consider it. Right. So let's describe what this bill does. Uh, Senate Bill 245 is about to is going to head to the floor of the California State Assembly. So it has already passed the Senate. It has gone through all of its necessary committees in the California Assembly, and the Assembly is going to have their general f- vote on it on the floor. And what this bill does is it eliminates all out-of-pocket costs to individuals for abortion, for anyone who has any kind of insurance. And uh, magically, it, it, it's magical. It, it magically makes it disappear. That cost yeah. just completely disappears, and no one I, else is going to have to burden the I responsibility. I don't know if you it. know, John, but the legislature can actually alter math. They they can actually right. make things that formerly cost money just they free, no longer magically. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, I mean, it, it is a blue state, and <laughs> this is a state that is, <laughs> you know, uh, rent control. Rent control is all of a sudden now a uh, popular. Anyway, I, I, won't, I won't get into I, rent I control. I have to say though, John, this is this is an important note to say d- that I think this is a really good example for our listeners uh, that a lot of times when we are fighting bills, sometimes you will hear pro-lifers and uh, you know social conservatives bring up concerns, and we will have a parade of horribles. And we'll say, if this happens, then this is going to happen. Right. And if that happens, then this is going to happen. Mm-hmm. And our, our our friends on the left will be like, oh, come on. You're That's just, just the slippery slope fallacy. You, you're fear-mongering. Mm-hmm. Come on. This, this is just so, come on. But this is, I think, a great example of, like, so much They're of what, not going to mandate anyone get the vaccine. <laughs> come on. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway. So Cal- in California, we have had this kind of steady march I mean, you think going back to, even on the federal level, going back to Obamacare and the fact that, well, you know, you're going to be mandated to get insurance. But look, that's just because we care about you. We're right. Just, we want you to have insurance because that's that's going to help you uh, yeah, be protected. Yeah, it's for your own good. Exactly. But then they start adding all of these strings attached. Well, you have to have an insurance plan that covers abortion. Yep. And you have to have an insurance plan that covers abortion, and your insurance company can't say anything if someone on your plan gets an abortion, like if your daughter, for example, gets an abortion on your insurance plan, uh, the insurance company cannot tell you that that has happened or cannot inform you of it in any way, shape, or form. And now, and and, and we just keep, well, it, it, it's all about this, it's all about this theory of access. Okay, the, the big liberal buzzword for abortion is access, safe, legal, and accessible 
That's what they want, is abortion to be universally accessible. And any barrier to access that anyone might experience, whether that's cost, whether that's the ability to not get to— if there's any kind of cost barrier to someone getting an abortion, our state legislature is committed to knocking that barrier down. Right. And that is what this bill purports to be. This is At least that's one of the things this bill is about. Now, Jonathan— this in conjunction with another piece of le- with the, the piece of legislation that was passed last year where i just mentioned you know they they have to keep any your insurance company has to keep any any information about someone on your plan getting an abortion private from you the account holder of, holder of the policy these things kind of go into con- in conjunction yes. to work in planned parenthood's favor yep. financially so maybe just explain that whole that whole concept, that, well, which which you are the first person to bring up, and I thought was brilliant. Well, so the thing on that, you, you again, you look at these piece by piece. People could look, and if you're a uh, if you're a dad and you have a teenage daughter who's going to school, and mm-hmm. maybe you've noticed that she has a boy coming around, and maybe you know you're you're not you're not thrilled, but you're thinking, okay, well, you know, yeah, we'll we'll see what happens here, and mm-hmm. you're you're trying to be a good dad, and then all of a sudden you notice this charge show up on your insurance and it's confidential medical services. Well, mm-hmm. that charge itself could be another red flag <laughs> yes. in the series. Of, yes. Now, I mean, if, if you know, like technically it's confidential, mm-hmm. but if you go to your wife and you're like, Hey, um, did you see this charge? Well, I didn't get any confidential medical services. Well, I didn't get any confidential medical services. Well, we know the four year old and the eight year old didn't get any confidential medical services. So that leaves the 14 year old. Right. And I'm just by process of elimination, you could probably at least figure out that something's going on. And it is a it's a red flag, it's a warning sign to say maybe there are maybe there's some shenanigans going on here. But when you combine that bill Mm -hmm. with this, with SB two forty five, if this passes, it would essentially even remove the red flag. Right. It it would it would assist the the hiding and the cover up of any of these things. Yeah, because then the girl doesn't need to pay anything out of pocket for her abortion. And I think the big financial thing here is that, okay, generally, if someone's on their parents' insurance and they don't want their parents to find out that they're having an abortion, well, they wouldn't use their parents' insurance to get the abortion. They would sign up for emergency Medi-Cal. The the Planned Parenthood would get them signed up. They would have a Medi-Cal-funded abortion, not a private insurance-funded abortion. So what these two pieces of legislation do, SB 245 which is possibly going to pass the state legislature, you know, very soon, along with last year's bill to get rid of any notification to a policyholder that someone on the policy was getting a, quote, confidential service, including an abortion. What this means is that Planned Parenthood's not going to get a Medi-Cal-funded abortion. Medi-Cal's not going to get a, excuse me, Planned Parenthood is not going to get a Medi-Cal reimbursement for that patient's abortion, they're going to get a private insurance reimbursement for that abortion. Which, for every doctor I have ever talked to, pays way better than uh, Medi-Cal. Yeah, of course. So, and, and as someone who's running a small prenatal health care clinic that, you know... Um, takes uh, insurance? That, yeah, that takes insurance. Like, uh, yeah, I know that Medi-Cal doesn't bill great, and, and that's kind of why we have a nonprofit clinic... Uh, Medi-Cal doesn't bill great. We're here to serve Medi-Cal uh, patients at Obrea. Um, but yeah, this is just going to be a huge boon to Planned Parenthood if a bunch of kids on their parents' insurance are getting a private insurance-funded abortion at Planned Parenthood. That's going to be a huge financial bur- boon for Planned Parenthood. So what we want to put together, um, basically we need to get in touch with our state assembly members and encourage them to vote no on SB 245. Uh, this shifts the cost for abortion onto anyone, who, onto people who are paying the premiums for their insurance. Okay, uh, you're not eliminating deductibles and copays for abortions, and then all of a sudden those costs just magically disappear. No, someone will shoulder that burden, and it will be your average Joe. Uh, it'll be your average Joe, you know, account holder paying the premium. I mean, that's pretty obviously where this is going to go. And all of this public policy, this is round one. I just want everyone to know. This year, 
and especially if the Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade, this is going to be the most insane year of passing horrible, obscene, pro-choice legislation, uh, possibly in a, lo- in a really long time. Uh, well, you talked about SB 245, John. The, the, the two bills that I know they've already introduced, we've talked about the future of abortion counsel, but a lot of those proposals are still, for the moment, they are still theoretical. There, I, I think there's a high chance they're going to get implemented in some capacity. But the two that I've seen so far are, uh, number one, uh, offering student loan forgiveness because, you know, for, a, good, for doctors who do abortions. Yeah, that's right. Medical school loan forgiveness. Literally uh, tr- treating, n- not treating doctors. I mean, the, the, the way, John, I know this is pretty macabre, but the way that I have put it is. Instead of Teach for America, where you go to school and you get right. a four-year degree and then you go teach in an underserved community, maybe mm-hmm. in Mississippi or Alabama or right. Detroit or the Bronx, uh, instead of Teach for America, it's Abort for America. Exactly. Abort for California. And and it's so gross because, and speaking of gross, well, anyway, it is it is revolting because Dr. Daniel Grossman, I'm sure, is behind this. Dr. Daniel Grossman, who's the head of the Bixby Center for Reproductive Studies or Science or whatever at University of California, San Francisco, and he is one of the leading pro-choice public policy advocates in the nation and certainly in California. He's always going to Sacramento to testify on behalf of horrible legislation. And, you know, at the Bixby Center, he's training medical students how to do abortions. They're doing abortions there. And this whole piece of legend given how tied in he is in Sacramento he specifically is this just feels like it's a it's a student loan forgiveness program for his students for his grad students for his medical students uh it's it's disgusting i mean it like we're th- this is the extent to which the pro choice movement has the state legislature in their pocket that under the cover of Oh, we're uh, you know expanding access for women. What are they really doing? They're giving this huge financial, all these different financial boons to whether it's Planned Parenthood itself, to pro-choice abortion doctors themselves. I mean, well, as we wrap up this segment, I'll, I'll close with this. So, Jonathan, what was that story about when Planned Parenthood built a huge abortion clinic right near the U.S. Mexico border, like south of San Diego. Yeah, and there was a licensing thing. There was like a licensing I, I thing think that it abortion was in Imperial County in Imperial County, and they had to have abortion clinics at that time had to be within a certain mile radius of a hospital. Mm-hmm. And Planned Parenthood wanted to build this clinic outside of that radius. So what did the California legislature do? Well, they just changed the law. Yep, they just changed the law almost purely and specifically so that Planned Parenthood. Uh, you know, got rid of a safety requirement around abortion purely so that Planned Parenthood could build uh, some big uh, El abortion Centro, facility. Way down yeah, in El, El Centro. Centro. In El Centro, California, yeah. And they were literally, John, they were advertising across the border in Mexico with Spanish-language flyers saying, hey, hey, come to the United States, get an abortion. Get, right. don't, don't stay in Mexico where it's illegal. All right. We've got a lot more to discuss Uh, We got a lot more California-specific stuff. I can give my little update on the Walk for Life West Coast. And then after that, some all kinds of national stuff. Are pro-lifers white supremacists? Um, No, we're not. Uh, We'll discuss that next (laughs) on Right to Life Radio right here on Power Talk. Uh, All right, Jonathan. California is going to have an absurd, um, a, a completely absurd year in our state legislature. Yes. The state legislature is freaked out about the fact that Roe v. Wade is going to be overturned. There, the, John, there's one bill that we didn't get a chance to talk about in the last segment. I okay. don't know if you've heard about this. Well, let's hear it. It's the new um, Abortion Indemnification Act, which I'm just calling it that. I don't think they're officially calling it that. But okay. essentially it says that any citizen of the state of California who uh, <clears throat> aids or abets an abortion of a citizen of another state cannot be held liable for any penalties uh, arising from laws in that state. Oh, so this is basically if a California person is in Texas and helps out doing an abortion, then they can't be sued. Or vice versa. If someone comes or, from Texas out here 
Mm-hmm. Whoever pays for the abortion, whoever commits the abortion, whoever drives them for the abortion, etc. No, 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 don't worry. We got your back. So Cal- California, California will will protect you. You can't be sued under Texas's SB8 law. Okay. So so if you come out to California, then a court and you can't be sued in a in a Texas court? What, I, what's what's going on I, here? I see the thing that I don't understand is how this doesn't end up at the Supreme Court because the the Texas law, SB8, essentially it said that anybody if you are enticing, incentivizing, aiding, abetting, you know, whatever nefarious term you want to use, if you want to try to commit an abortion that kills the child of a woman who is a uh-huh. Texas resident, uh-huh. whether she is certainly in the state, but there's even, John, there's some argument that even if you commit that abortion, that abortion out of state, but it's on a Texas resident, huh. then someone within the state of Texas could sue you and oh, say, okay. hey, you are, you are violating Texas law by this whole committing thing, this abortion. This whole thing seems like, and our state legislature really enjoys doing this because it's a full-time job being a state legislator, <laughs> and they Full a full-time time job. And, John, and just, um, that, like, uh, they, they, they have all year to work on legislation, unlike, say, the Indiana legislature that meets for one month every two years. And gets the entire business of the state done or, in one month. Or for Virginia, which I, I was just back there. I went to their capital at Richmond yeah. and was meeting with our counterparts at the, yeah. uh, the the family foundation out there. And, yeah, their legislature is 45 days. Yeah. It's, the <laughs> whole legislative session is 45 days. And they so, get paid a whopping 20 grand for their work. Well, good. Yeah. you know They have to have so, real yeah. jobs yeah, instead as, of just as opposed to sucking off the government teat. <laughs> That's a T E A T. Yes. It's not a curse word. It's not. Don't come at us, FCC. It's not even obscene. It's, it's not it's, even obscene. It's, it's, an, it's, an it's a agric- part of the body. An agriculture term. It's an agricultural term. Here anyway. in Fresno. Anyway, <laughs> all of our Tulare County listeners, you know <laughs> what we're right. talking about. All you dairy, all you Portuguese dairy farmers. <laughs> um, so, so our state legislature, because they're in, they're they're working all year round. They're much more willing to engage in these performative stunts, these acts of legislative performative nonsense, which are basically just elaborate ways of saying we don't like what's happening over in state X that we don't like. So remember how California, after like Georgia passed their anti-abortion law, California passed that law. We're not going to pay for any state employees to travel to Georgia anymore unless it's you know, like important or something. <laughs> and they had these huge carve outs and it's like, oh, so you're not going to let UCLA go play Georgia Tech? Yep. Yep. Well, no, that'll be allowed. <laughs> if it's really because important. Because it's like, 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 yeah. like The NCAA. They, yeah, like nothing that would actually have caused anyone to lose any money or anything important. It's just a big performative thing on the part of the legislature to say, we don't like you. Because they don't have anything better to do, clearly. I mean, it's amazing how long it takes the state legislature not to give sufficient care and attention to legislation. Like, they, you know, <coughs> excuse me, you'd think for a legislative body that's in session all year, they could have le- legislative hearings that last more than two minutes. <coughs> <laughs> <coughs> As I am dying live on radio. Uh, no, all I, right. I, I, and John, I don't I, have a I, cough button. Don't even get me started because they don't even have a two minute limit in Virginia. Yeah. And their session's 45 days long. Right, exactly. All right, our state legislature stinks. When we return, are pro-lifers white supremacists? Next on Right to Life Radio. Uh, um, I want to talk about the dumbest article of the weekend of the March for Life. Oh. The March for Life always brings out the worst in the pro and the anniversary of Roe, more generally, brings out the worst in the pro-choice side. And it's this article, uh, uh, this co- uh, this op-ed piece in The Guardian, which is a UK website, a UK newspaper, rather. And it says, white nationalists are flocking to the U.S. anti-abortion abortion movement. And it's written by Moira Donegan. The white supremacist and anti-choice movements have always been closely linked. Always, Jonathan. <laughs> always. But more and more, they are becoming difficult to tell apart. Feel like they were never that close. In fact, we're explicitly on opposing sides of certain very 
critical cultural debates very early on. Just a bit. And are still very easy to tell apart. So let me begin this screed. And by the way, why am I talking about this? Some of you may have heard of Father James Martin, who is a Jesuit priest and a very prominent, well, the media makes him a prominent commentator. He's the editor at large of America Magazine, which is a very left-leaning uh, journal of American Catholic opinion, or of Jesuit opinion, anyway. <laughs> and um, <laughs> that's mean. There are some very good Jesuits, anyway. Uh, but there's just very, not in the United there's States. some very non-good Jesuits too. There are some good American Jesuits, but yeah. Anyway, so Father Martin um, leans left on a lot of things. He is himself opposed to abortion, and has said our laws should reflect the dignity of human life. He does reject, though, some USCCB, the, the formulations by the Catholic bishops. The Catholic bishops have repeatedly said that, that abortion is the preeminent social issue of our time, which is something that uh, Father Martin has explicitly criticized. I don't know, John. I mean, climate change is a pretty big deal. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty bad. Anyway, it's as bad as... 63 million people dying since 1973. I don't know about that. Anyway, so he sent this out. He retweeted this saying pro-life should not mean being a white nationalist, which is an indication that he agrees. I, I, I mean, maybe I'm taking it a step too far. And when people say retweets are not endorsements, by the way, People who say that on Twitter, the retweet does not mean endorsement. Yeah, it does. Don't give, me, don't give me that BS. The only reason you retweet something is if you're either explicitly slamming it or if you, you like it. Anyway, I, whatever. I would, say, I would say retweets without commentary. It's kind of hard yeah, to say. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> whatever. All right. Let's, uh, people who don't use Twitter are probably listening to this thinking, uh -huh. I have no idea what this person What started. is All right. Twitter? All right. So Father James Martin, very prominent liberal-leaning Catholic priest, uh, sent this out on his Twitter platform. Let me read this for you. This weekend's, again, this is in the, the Guardian, the UK magazine, written by Moira Donegan. This weekend's March for Life rally, the large anti-choice demonstration held annually in Washington, D.C. to mark the anniversary of the Roe v. Wade decision, has the exuberant quality of a victory lap. This, the 49th anniversary of Roe, is likely to be its last. The U.S. Supreme Court is poised to overturn Roe in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health, which is set to be decided this spring. For women in Texas, Roe has already been nullified. The court went out of its way to allow that allow what Justice Sonia Sotomayor called a, quote, flagrantly unconstitutional abortion ban to go into effect there, depriving abortion rights in, to the one in ten American women of reproductive age who live in the nation's second largest state. John, I just have you to You know, say for it. a pro-lifer, uh, this is not the kind of uh, article I'd be sharing, even if I agreed with concerns about, uh, you know, white supremacy. I, I, I don't would, know. I After that, starting salvo. I would also say, though, John, give me, uh, give me the confidence in the pro-life uh, bona fides of the six conservative justices of this Guardian reporter. Oh, I, yeah. They, I they're wish. already... Oh, yeah. Uh, like, I, have, I, I don't trust John Roberts as far as I can throw him, and this gal is like, oh, yeah, definitely going to overturn Roe. I certainly hope so. Jeez Louise. These victories, Moira Donegal. Donegal or Donegan? Whatever. She's Irish either way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was about to make a derogatory comment about my own people. Uh, these victories have made visible a growing cohort within the anti-choice movement. Growing. Or it's either they've always been the major constituency of the pro-life movement, or now, but now they're growing. Okay. The, with the very scientific method she has here. That's right. Made visible a growing cohort within the anti-choice movement, the militias and explicitly white supremacist groups of the organized far right. Like last year, this year's March for Life featured featured an appearance <laughs> by Patriot Front, a white nationalist group that wears a uniform of balaclavas and khakis. Balaclava, I believe, is like a face covering ba thing. Balaclava. Balaclava, that sort of face covering thing where you can only see someone's eyes. The reason the I know that is uh, that it's a balaclava is because when I was in Boy Scouts and we would go snow camping, we all had to wear balaclavas, balaclavas because it was... Even colder really than cold. the March for Life. Okay. The group, which also marched at a Chicago March for Life demonstration earlier this month, silently handed out cards to members of the press who tried to ask them questions. 
America belongs to its fathers and it is owed to its sons, the cards read. The restoration of American sovereignty must follow the restoration of the American family. Explicit white nationalism with an emphasis on conscripting white women into reproduction is not a fringe element of the anti-choice movement. It 100% is a fringe <laughs> element of the anti-choice movement. All right, let, let, let's just stop here. All right, all right. So, l- l- like, first of all, uh, I am the pro-life... Well, and I'm sorry, sounding like Louis XIV here. I am the pro-life movement. Now, I'm not saying that because I'm the most... Je pro-life suis movement. Le, le mouvement pro-life. <laughs> no, uh, I'm not saying that, like, I am the most important person in the pro-life movement. I mean, you know, EWTN... I don't know why you replaced Catherine Hadro with uh, with Prudence Robertson or whatever. I mean, like, what? Are we chopped liver here? Sorry. Like, like we couldn't host EWTN for Life Weekly? Hey, anyway. Um, half the price. I mean, I you know, it. I mean, anyway. Oh, oh, 100% half the price. <laughs> we we would have done it for, like, yeah. you know, like some gift cards. On a lark. That's to, right. You know, we would have done it for some gift cards to Wendy's or something. That's anyway. Right. So. No, no, no. It's got to be right. Papa John's. So we're I'm talking saying, about a Catholic show. It's got to right. be Papa John's gift cards. Yeah, exactly. Okay. By saying I am the pro-life movement. Let me just say I'm a fairly cons- representative person within the pro-life movement among pro-life. I run a regional pro-life educational organization, and I run a pro-life prenatal health care uh, clinic. Uh, lots of other people within our movement run things. They run pregnancy care uh, centers or clinics, They or, you know pregnancy resource clinics. Uh, many of them work for educational organizations. I have not met one pro-life person. Who's like, we got to have more white women have more white babies so that we can restore the race. No. And I talk with pro-lifers. They're my friends. They're my confidants. I've had confidence. Jonathan and I, we, we're, we're buddies. And, right. and Jonathan has never come to me and be like, you know what, Johnny? Gosh darn it. We got to just we got to start having more white babies. So we got to right. just replace the, the we have to. America is owed to its sons by its fathers. <laughs> I'm like, no, As, especially, John, I would say if you go to uh, either the National March for Life, but especially the Walk for Life West Coast, the Walk for Life West Coast, I would say that the um, the folks like you and me that are either um, generically Anglo-Saxon. like Yes. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Or Italian and Irish. <laughs> yeah. We are in the minority in most cases. White people were almost certainly the minority at the Walk for Life West Coast. Or, or if not, I mean, it was very close. Okay. The Walk for Life West Coast, tons of Latinos. Big lots families. Lots of Asian Americans. Yep. Lots of Filipinos. Lots of Asian Americans. Lots of Latinos. Uh, a good representation of African Americans. And... This idea, like, if you you cannot go to the Walk for Life West Coast without realizing this is a very ethnically diverse movement. And, and I mean, just look at the people we promote. I, I, we had Reverend, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Clenard Childress, mm-hmm. I believe, spoke yep. at the Walk for Life West Coast. Like, I mean, and, I'm not, and liberals will say, oh, yeah, you get one token black guy up there to talk. No, he's not a token black guy. He's a very important member of the movement. He's a valued member of the movement. Yep. Pastor Walter Hoy, another very valued member of the movement. Star Parker. Like, yeah, like th- this is not... Anyway, so... And John, uh, on that note also, I have to say that it's it's amazing to me because I think that far from far from the thing that you said where oh you know how can we how can we ethnically purify the <laughs> the pro life yeah. movement a consistent topic of discussion is what can we do as a pro life movement to be even more welcoming to to the african yeah african americans hispanics and asians I, I don't know how many times i've seen pro lifers talk about the horrible statistic of the number of african american pregnancies that end in abortion and talk about it as a horrible tragic terrible thing i mean i i spoke last week at the funeral of my very dear friend and former board member of right to life uh, pastor tyrone carter who is an african-american pastor here in the city of fresno deeply committed to the pro-life cause for whom this was a driving issue for him the number of african-american children who were killed in abortion so here's the thing if we pro-lifers are white supremacists and want to restore the white race to its rightful position of dominance in American society, then we are going about it all wrong. Because abortion hugely disproportionately takes the lives of of minority children. Like, it's it's enormous numbers of African-American children, larger, it, it, not, as, not as high a percentage of Latino children. 
And then it's probably after that is white, uh, white uh, the white abortion rate. So Which the idea why... that the idea that we are advancing the cause of preserving white, you know, the white racial purity of America, because we oppose something that's killing African American children. Also, Margaret Sanger. Now, Margaret Sanger wasn't an abortion proponent; she was a birth control proponent, but explicitly racist, yep. straight hard racist, straight yep. up racist. And promoted birth control. Why? Why did she and early Planned Parenthood proponents want birth control? Because black people were having too many babies. Because they were eugenicists. Yep. Black people were having too many babies. Italians were having too many babies. Irish were having too many babies. Mexicans were having too many babies. Like, that was the whole point of... Uh, th that was a large percentage, anyway, of the point of their movement was to create a race of thoroughbreds by which they meant white people. Hmm. White Anglo-Saxon Protestants. In fact, if anything, Jonathan, as the lone white Anglo-Saxon <laughs> Protestant in this room, is the minority. That's right. So, as someone who is a descendant of formerly considered unfit races like Italians and uh, I, well, anyway, well, as if any race is unfit, whatever. So, this whole article is straight up hot garbage and is based on first. Uh, the jo whole thing is premised on the big lie of, and actually, we're going to make this segment longer rather than shorter, <laughs> Raphael. It's all premised on this lie that somehow. By opposing abortion, we're we're going that that somehow that's going to lead to more white people and fewer black people. That that's the whole point of the abortion movement, and it's just not true. If if anything, if we were real white supremacists, we would want more abortion because again, it's disproportionately impacting the African American community. John, I also have to say this: uh, when you see one random group of jerks that show up at the March for Life. Mm -hmm. They are decried as, oh, well, look, here you go. Finally, the pro-life movement is uh, revealing its true face. Right. The mask is coming off. Yeah. Whereas on the flip side, and I knew, I'm like, I had to look up and see mm -hmm. what was the quote. Uh, it was uh, a, a, a quote from uh, President Biden when he was running for office. Oh, yeah. When President Biden said that Antifa is just an idea, it's yeah, not like a he real said, thing. Antifa is an idea, not an organization. Yeah. So, so <laughs> we, we, how dare we say that anyone involved with a Black Lives Matters protest, where where many of those protests, not the one in Fresno, I'll note, but many of those protests in other parts of the country involved violent riots. But no, 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 don't you dare criticize anyone in the Black Lives Matters movement as having anything to do with violent rioting. Which and look, you know, if, if there were core people in the Black Lives Matters movement who were not involved with violent rioting, more power to them. Yep. But one group of doofuses shows up at the March for Life, doesn't stay for the whole March for Life. They don't is speak. in a group separate from the March for Life because the March for Life organizers were like, "Get away from us! They're we don't want you here." Vocally condemned. Vocally condemned. And by the way, John, I also have to tell you because I saw this internally. I talked to my friends mm -hmm. who were running the march. Mm -hmm. They literally had staff members who were on the lookout the entire day uh -huh. for anybody who had any signs that were approaching white supremacy. Right. And saying, no, no, no. You, if you see anybody, tell us we're out. bouncing them out of here. Right. They exactly. were They were proactively yeah. trying to throw anybody yeah. out. So at any rate, uh, by the way, I can also make the argument that Patriot Front is... Just a fed sigh out that I, I I do not actually believe they are real white supremacists. I think they're FBI agents trying to catch white supremacists. Anyway, just my just my just my theory. It's only supported by really good evidence. Anyway, uh, when we return, we'll close out the show uh, with a few more thoughts on our experiences at the two marches for life. You're listening to Right to Life Radio on Power Talk 96.7 AM 1400. Anyway, Rights of Life Radio, thank you all so much for tuning in. That's good stuff. I want to thank the members of our 300 Club. The 300 Club is the way you can support Right to Life of Central California. Go to rtlcc.org, click the Join the 300 Club button, and it's basically you giving us 25 bucks a month. It's 300 bucks in a year. Come on, you're subscribed to a couple of streaming services that you never watch, or that if you do watch, they're not necessarily making enriching your life anymore. Uh, and uh, 25 bucks a month, and it really helps us with paying our bills and you know continuing our ongoing programs, rtlcc.org. I want to thank all the people who've joined in December and January. I th want to thank Jerry Codernes, Michael Doherty, James Drooley, Laura Gurries, Gerald Logaluso, Ann Olson, Luann Taus Towsley, 
um, Dr. Mike Habibi, Michael to- Michael Troy, Katie Ferris, and Katie Ferris. That's the end of the list. So thank uh-huh. you all so much to all of you for joining. All right, Jonathan. In the last uh, few minutes of the show here, you went to the D.C. March. I went to I the did. San Francisco March. Uh, give me first uh, – I'll, I'll go first so you have time to think. Initial reactions to the march. Um, my initial reaction was – how young the march was, Every how year. diverse the march was, as opposed to the morons who keep saying that, oh, the, the March for Life is a movement of white nationalists. Well, I would like you to inform that to the tens of thousands of Spanish-speaking participants at the Walk for Life West Coast. We were basically, I heard more rosaries in Spanish, hymns sung <laughs> in Spanish, groups of almost entirely uh, Latin Americans uh, participate. There are probably more, almost as many as, possibly more than there were white people uh, in mm-hmm. in attendance. So uh, that was my initial reaction. So I want to, what was your reaction to the march in D.C.? I would also say on that note, the uh, the big tent nature of the march because uh, this year I was excited to see. Obviously, you have the the main organization, March for Life, led by our friend Jeannie Mancini. Uh, which, by the way, on that note, side note, speaking of the National March, come to California's March for Life. We've announced the date, June 22nd. June 22nd. All right, it is great. set for the uh, Capitol in Sacramento. So th- th- they do a great job. There's, John, unsurprisingly, there are a lot of Catholics that lead the march. Yes, there are. And are involved. <laughs> but it was amazing this year to see, walking around the march, seeing uh, lots of different parishes, but also seeing Lutherans and Southern Baptists and people from Focus on the Family and uh, our friend uh, Monica Snyder, mm-hmm. uh, Nick Renosa from uh, uh, Secular Pro Life. Oh, wonderful. Um, Kristen Turner and uh, Teresa Bukovinac from POW, the Progressive Anti Abortion Uprising. <laughs> Uh, it was just, it was really amazing to see kind of a, a very motley crew in a good way. Yeah. That was, I, I'm just laughing at the acronym. That's yes. all I'm laughing at. Like, like that's a, that's a, that's a classic, uh, Teresa acronym. Yes. So anyway, it was, um, I loved it. I mean, every time you go, I encourage everybody. Yes. Go to the March, um, in the DC, go to the walk on the West coast because they each, they each give you a different slice of the pro-life movement and, mm-hmm. It's hard to believe, John. When I didn't realize that we were back there, but this this could literally be the last year. Yeah, that we, that Roe v. Wade. Rose Law. Roe v. Wade has been on the books for this is the 49th anniversary, and it might not make it to a 50th. So let's all pray for that. That will do it as Dean Martin plays us out for Right to Life Radio. We will see you next week on Power Talk. <laughs>